liked it. He was willing to admit that my first conviction was probably a miscarriage of justice, but even though the first jury made a mistake, he said I didn't have the right to commit a murder just to correct that mistake. He demanded the death penalty, and I was condemned to death. But uh, this time you were pardoned. No, this time they didn't even commute my sentence. You see, the fact that I killed my friend with a policeman's club made it a very serious crime. Then uh, will you tell us, Mr. Shanderson, how did you manage to escape? I didn't escape. Well, what happened to get you out of it? Nothing. I was executed. Executed? This is absurd. It was on the morning of the 29th of February, 1932. A leap year. It was a gray and rainy morning. The hangman put the noose around my neck. And then we had to wait because some official forgot his glasses. They held an umbrella over me so I wouldn't get wet. And then the official's glasses came. He read something. The minister prayed. I closed my eyes and thought of my mother. The floor went out from under me, and that was that. I must protest against this fantastic and childish assault upon our, our intelligence. You'll be quiet. Then what happened? The next thing I felt was a finger with a rubber glove on it. It was in my mouth, pressing down on my tongue. I bit it, and somebody yelled. I opened my eyes, and that was the first time I saw Dr. Pretorius. Only he wasn't a doctor then, just a medical student. I think I can make this next part of the story clear to you. At the time all this happened, I was just finishing my studies as a medical student. I was also keeping company, as they say, with a young lady who happened to be the hangman's daughter. Both the hangman and his daughter were generous and sympathetic. The hangman, in particular, was sympathetic to my desire as a student of anatomy to have a cadaver of my own. Well, knowing that Mr. Shunderson's body would go unclaimed, because certainly no one was ever more alone in this world than poor Mr. Shunderson was, the hangman managed to send it to me immediately after the hanging, along with a sweet note from his daughter. I was delighted, of course. But not for long. I soon found out that Mr. Shunderson was still alive. You must have been furious. He told me a story. We put some pig iron in the cheap wooden coffin that he'd arrived in and had it buried in a charity graveyard. From that day on, he has never left me. And I think it is understandable that from time to time he may seem a little confused and perhaps even a little dull-witted. I don't mean to intrude too much, gentlemen, but I, I'm sure that by now you must have made up your minds. Deborah, a wife simply does not come barging into a room when her husband is being investigated. After all, if he's innocent, he's late for the concert. And if he isn't, well, he'd better start conducting anyway, because he may have to earn his living at it. I am of the opinion the hearing is at an end. Do you agree, Professor Elwell? The trouble with you is, Elwell, you've never had a cadaver of your own, much less one that bit your finger. And as for this incredible evening, gentlemen, the sooner we can forget it, the better for all concerned. And I think we've held up the concert far too long. Professor Elwell, you're a little man. It's not that you're short, you're little in the mind and in the heart. Tonight you try to make a man little whose boots you couldn't touch if you stood on tiptoe on top of the highest mountain in the world. And as it turned out, you're even littler than you were before. 